Welcome to episode 7 of Real Life, Real Gospel. I'm your host, Josh Laborious. I'm here at St. Paul Lutheran Church and School in Boca Raton, Florida. That is our host that uh, they make it possible for us to be here. And if this is your first time listening in, welcome. Glad you're here. And just kind of know, so you know what the show is about, what I'm trying to accomplish here is to take issues that you and I face in a real, in, in the real world, in real life, and see how our Christian faith applies to them, especially issues that I guess maybe we don't think about as frequently. And most of our topics come from suggestions by listeners, by people who want to hear, I guess, what I have to say, what, what the Bible has to say, hopefully, on a given topic. And that being said, this week we are going to discuss worship um, and how it impacts our daily life and what it looks like as it is reflected into our daily life. This is a topic courtesy of Debbie Feidler. And at this point, I would invite you as well. Feel free to submit topics, comment on whatever medium you listen to this on, whether it's uh, YouTube or Podbean or... um, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, we we are broadcasting on all of these platforms. Um, You can comment on those or you can message me on Facebook or send me an email, vicar at St. Paul Boca, and I will add your topic to the list and we will get to it. So today, as I mentioned, we're talking about Debbie's topic and that is worship and how it is reflected into our daily lives. Now, what do I mean when I say worship? Especially if you're listening to this and maybe you're less familiar with, uh, I guess, Christian lingo, Christian words. Um, first of all, I want to say I'm going to do my best to avoid them. Theological language, academic language. Um, I'm going to try to avoid it because a lot of times we use it and we don't really, uh, we use it to distance ourselves from reality a little bit. So, Unless it's completely necessary, I I will do my best to avoid it. So when I'm talking about worship, typically we're referring to Sunday morning when Christians gather together in a church or a gym or a fellowship hall or um, a shopping mall in some cases, and they they worship. And we're going to see what that looks like and how that is reflected into our daily lives. How should that impact our daily lives? How do our daily lives reflect a life of worship. And what does that look like? What does a life of worshiping God look like? And you may say, why does this matter? Um, Well, first of all, people get really upset about worship. People are really up in arms and people love to argue about it. So I'd love, frankly, to diffuse some of that and help us move forward in in what is important and, and in how it impacts our lives and our walks with God. And the other reason that it matters is if you go through, this is what we're going to be doing in heaven. If you look in Revelation, um, <laughs> this is what the saints do in heaven. They worship God. So looking at what it looks like to worship God and what the Bible says about worshiping God, um, it's really worthwhile. So with that, this is real worship, real gospel. And as always, we're going to start with scripture. And we're going to look at what scripture has to say on the topic. And then I'll add some commentary and some thinking of my own. Um, And we're going to start in the Psalms. Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. So some some background notes, some textual notes on Psalm 103. This is David worshiping God. And in reality, most of the Psalms are representations of different people in different circumstances worshiping God and what it looks like. So this book as a whole is a really good one to go to to see what a life of worship looks like. It's an example for us. And 
the really cool thing about Psalm 103 is that it's remembering what God has done for his people. It's remembering what God has done for the psalmist. So as we get into worship, uh, I think this pulls out one really important facet of worship is that it is a response of a grateful people to their God. And this is an example of worship. So what I want to take away for the practicality of this text is what are the f- is the functionality of worship? Why why do we worship? Why do we spend our time in this way? And I think first and foremost the example that comes out of this is that worship is a time of thanksgiving. And what does that look like? Well, maybe that looks like song, maybe that looks like uh just speaking, and maybe that is just a reflection of thankfulness because God does know our hearts, does know our our minds in that way. It is also a remembrance of God's work. It's a great opportunity to to communicate to other people, whether it be people coming in or maybe it is kids or future generations. It's an opportunity to educate and remind people, here is what God has done for us, for his people. You also have... um, a centering effect. Worship recenters us on God, especially in in our reality as we live our lives. The nature of humanity is to to drift away from God. But I think especially regular worship it anchors us and it recenters us in Christ. And finally what it does is it connects us both to God and to one another. And that's one of the cool powerful things about worship is We are praising God, and while we praise God here on earth, we know that we praise together with the saints who are in heaven. So Christians and God's people who have gone before us and who will come after us, we're connected with them as we worship because we are worshiping the same God together. And that's really, and it's connecting us to God for obvious reasons that I've listed. It's reminding us what he does, how he works, it's thanking him. Um, but it's it's putting us in his presence. So we have these these functions for worship. And what can we take away from all of this? What can we take away from the psalm is to bless the Lord. And as we worship, whether that's corporately on Sunday or through our, our daily lives, you don't have to go to church to bless the Lord. That is something that can be reflected into our daily lives as things happen in our lives, as we are blessed. We can take some small amount of our day and, and just say thank you. And even if it's just pausing for a minute and saying, man, God is really blessing me here. Or maybe it is you stop, it's full stop and you pray. And you say, thank you, God, for blessing me in whatever way he has blessed you. So that's one way that worship can get reflected into our daily lives and can impact how we live on a regular basis. And another thing is it just is a worship as a reminder for everything God does for us. That also can get reflected into our daily lives, especially as we suffer. To look back on our lives and say, look at how God has already worked in my life and on my behalf. And it reminds us to trust him. And that is something that I think is very helpful and beneficial to reflect into our daily lives because it keeps us centered in God and in the work that he does in our lives. So what does it look like on a daily basis? That's a little bit of what it looks like on a daily basis because worship is not just Sunday morning or Saturday night or whenever you go to church to worship with your church family. Worship is a daily thing. It doesn't only take place in a church. It talks as we move into the gospel, as we thank God for what he's done, as we live and and follow his commandments, as we share the gospel with one another. We're doing the things of worship in our lives. We're doing all of these things, thanking God, remembering God centering on God, connecting to God and one another. These are all things that we can do 
on a daily basis. But the the real life reality of this is that it's hard to worship. And I think two main reasons that it's hard to worship in our daily lives especially is the first, we are busy people. There's a saying, I have no idea who said it, but it, the saying is nature abhors a vacuum. If there is a gap, if there is something empty, something is going to fill that gap. In the same way, if you have empty time in your day, something is going to fill that time. So if we don't, if we're not careful, all of our time that we could spend worshiping, even if it's just a couple seconds in the midst of our day, it can disappear if we are not protective of it. And another reason that it's hard to worship is because worshiping gives credit to something else, to someone else. If we are blessed in our lives, our instinct is to say, oh man, I've done really well and I've earned this. If we say, thank you, God, for blessing me in in this way, it takes credit away from ourselves and gives it to God. And that is tough. That is a hard thing to do. But the, the real life, the reality, the law here is that we are called to do it anyway, even if it is tough to make time, even if it is tough to bring ourselves to give that credit to God. We're called to do it. We are called to bless the Lord. But the real gospel in in all of this is God gives us plenty to worship him for. We're blessed in that we don't have to look hard or look far to see blessings that God has bestowed on us. We don't have to look far to remember how God works in our lives, to thank God for what he's done. Worship at its core, is a response to blessing in abundance. So even as we do maybe struggle to make time or, or bring ourselves to worship, the, the blessing is that the reason that we worship is because we are blessed, because God works in our lives. And all of this kind of drives us, and the fact that we can do this on a regular basis drives us into our gospel for today. And our gospel for today is from John 4. The woman said the woman said to him, and this is she's speaking to Jesus, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship your Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship God in Father, the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So some background on this text is this is the story of the woman at the well. So the woman at the well, Jesus approaches this woman, and she is a Samaritan. Now, a little bit of the political history of Israel up to this point, Samaria and Israel split years ago, and there was a lot of bad blood as a result of that split. So much so that Jews and Samaritans hated one another. Jews would refuse to speak to Samaritans. And part of that split came when David when Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem and said, we, mu- we worship here now, and God resides in the temple. Because what that did is because Jerusalem was the capital of Israel, is Samaritans were separated, were distanced from that worship. And that's kind of what is driving this conversation that we see in, in the gospel reading. Um, because she's saying, you say we have to worship in Jerusalem, but we've been worshiping on this mountain since before there was a temple in Jerusalem. Now, 
you may say, well, how does this apply to us today? And I would contend that we have and we continue to erect temples. Whether this be literal, the literal church buildings that we build or styles of worship or ways of worship, we've built temples and we say other people have to worship this way or you have to worship in this place or at this time or in this manner. And I would say that these are temples because this can exclude people from worshiping God. So these words of Jesus are really comforting and saying, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And you may say, well, what does that mean? What does it mean to worship in spirit and in truth? Some notes on this. It is not a particular style of worship, whether that be a spiritual style where people are um, speaking out, they feel like they're speaking in the spirit or they are speaking in the spirit, um, whether you have a certain sort of instrumentation or not, whether you feel a certain way in worship or not. That's not what it's talking about when it's saying worship in the spirit. And when it's saying worship in truth, it's not meaning worship the same way the church of hundreds of years ago worshiped. It's not saying we must use an organ, which by the way, when this was written, organs did not exist. So what I'm trying to get at here is worship is not one style. It is not contemporary or traditional. That is the only right kind of worship. It is not only in a church building that's constructed a certain way that you can worship in spirit and truth. It is not in a certain area. It is not in a certain manner of speaking. So what? these are all what it's not because I know these are things people argue about and they say, oh, if you worship with guitars, you're not really worshiping. Or if you worship with an organ, you're not really worshiping. If you use the liturgy, if you don't use the liturgy, if you're in a church, if you're in, not in it, people will say, oh, you're not really worshiping. Stop it. If you are listening to this podcast and you would contend that someone isn't worshiping because they don't worship like you, stop it. I am calling you out on your sin. Stop it. Because that is not what worship is about. What worship is about is connecting you to God. Worship is about the truth of God's word. So what would I say is necessary for worship? You need, you need God's word present. If you are going to worship, you ought to be reading the scriptures. Whether that is a time for people to have their own Bibles and, and read and reflect, or whether that is someone up front reading the scriptures, whatever it looks like, there should be dedicated time to spending in God's word. So you have that. You have um, praise, whatever that looks like for you. And maybe the way that you feel you can most, uh, you can best praise God are through the historic hymns of whatever church body you're a part of. And that is phenomenal. That is, they, have, they have served Christians well for years. In the same way, if you feel, if your praise is best expressed in contemporary music that has been written in the last decade, instruments of guitars and drums and whatever you have, then I would encourage you in that as well. Whatever ex is your expression of praise, I am in no place and no one is in any place to tell you that one expression of praise is better or worse than another. As long as we're connected to God through that. Another thing that I would, I would say, I would think, is important and an important part of worship, whether it be daily life or on Sunday morning, is confession and absolution. Is the church, whether it be individually or, or corporately, and individuals saying, I have sinned, admitting that. And hearing Christ's forgiveness. Uh, and you may, you may say, oh, but I know I'm forgiven. It is still something to be able to say on a regular basis, yes, I know I have sinned. And having someone else remind you that you are forgiven. 
That is a powerful thing, and I think it has a place in worship because that is the truth that we cling to, that we are forgiven. Without that core truth, none of the rest of it matters. So I think that is a crucial part of worship. And then finally, I would say um, a celebration of the sacrament, which for Lutherans is Holy Communion and Baptism, because those are two places where God has promised to work in the midst of his people through ordinary means of bread and wine and water. And what's really cool, especially about communion, is again, that connects us with Christians who have come before and Christians who have come after us because we're sharing in this common communion. This this expression of our faith, this gift from God. So I think that is a key part of, of corporate worship especially. So what does that look like for daily life? And you may say, well, this is all about weekend worship. No, 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 no. I want to bring this into our daily lives. What does it look like to reflect that worship into our daily lives? And the first I would say is spend time daily in God's word. Never in the history of the world has God's word been so acceptable. If you can't afford a Bible, on your phone, there are free Bible apps. Read a little bit every day. If you're more comfortable with a printed page, go out, get a Bible. Read a little bit of the Bible every day. That's a really easy way. Another really easy way is confession and absolution. If you sin against your brother, go to them and ask for forgiveness. And ask that they forgive you. Confession and absolution. And if you have sinned in a way that it is before God, pray about it. Say, Father, I know that I have fallen short. I know I have sinned in this way. I ask that in the name of Jesus Christ, you forgive me. And I am confident in that forgiveness. Thank you for the blessing you've put in my life. Amen. Let that be your prayer on a daily basis in the midst of your life. And finally, live applying God's word. Live praising God, remembering what he has done for you, thanking him and reflecting that in your life, reflecting that gratefulness in your life. So a summary of this, this entire discussion so far, the, the re, real life reality is there is a temptation, there is a reality that we are tempted to erect temples, whether they be literal buildings or, or metaphorical in the way we worship and we demand people go to them. And this is a call to, to not do that, to encourage and enable people to worship in spirit and truth. But the other reality is that worshiping in spirit and truth is a high call because we are called to live in that way. And the, the real life reality that begins to transition us to the gospel is when we worship together is the best way that we have. So, well, yes, we should be doing all of these things on a daily basis. This is a, is a call also to worship together. Because in spirit and in truth includes in the community that we've been blessed with. And the real gospel, the real celebration and gift in all of this is that God uses worship to connect us to one another and also to Christians who have come before and Christians who will come after. <laughs> and the gospel that we have to remember in all of this is this is all a celebration because of everything that God has done and continues to do for us. And what that drives us into what thinking about this, especially on a regular basis, it drives us into the epistle, um, which we're going to take from Romans 12, 1 and 2, where we read, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Daily worship is spiritual worship. And I want to talk about this term, presenting your body as a living sacrifice. What this means is we are willing to give everything 
for God. Everything we do is credited to God's glory. Every single part of our lives is for God. And that definitely impacts our daily living, um, but that also, I would say, definitely impacts our weekend worship as well. So, ultimately, this is how church is worship is reflected into our lives. This isn't necessarily going to church every day. It's not some rite or script or particular prayer. It's living as a sacrifice. It's living with every second being for God's glory. Either exalting God or begging for forgiveness because we have failed. And it talks about doing what is good and acceptable and perfect. And this, this is part of the reason we spend so much time in God's Word. We're being renewed and taught every day by God's Word as far as what is good and pleasing and perfect and acceptable to God. And the real life, the reality of this is that it is hard to be a living sacrifice. It is hard to live every second of our lives for God because so many other things demand to be number one in our lives. And this is especially apparent on Sunday morning because you have people that say, oh, I can't go to church this week. I have practice. I have a game. I have a class. I'm on vacation. I don't have to go to church. People have all sorts of excuses. But the reality is church should be, worship should be the excuse that you give for other things. I can't go to practice that day. I have worship. I can't, I can't sleep in on this vacation day. I have worship. I can't do that meeting on Sunday. I have worship because our number one focus, our, our living sacrifice is that Christ and God and worship is our number one focus. And on a daily basis, because I said, this doesn't just mean going to church every day. What this means is taking time out of our day, out of the other things we do, to spend time in devotion, spend time in God's word, to pray. It's giving credit to God. It's taking, it's, it's decreasing so that he might increase. And the real life is there is no room for error. Any time we fail is a complete failure. But the gospel is that there is forgiveness for every time we fail. And that whenever we worship, whether it's in church on a weekend or just in the midst of our daily lives, God is with us. And that is an incredible blessing. So the summary of this entire podcast is that we are blessed. We are blessed with the opportunity to worship. And we're blessed with reasons upon reasons to worship for. The summary is this, this doesn't just take place in a, in a building or in a specific set of circumstances or in a specific way. You can worship in, in whatever way is most fitting for you to praise God and to be before him in spirit and in truth. And what does this look like on a daily basis? I think ultimately it is presenting our lives as a sacrifice to God saying at every single second of every single day, saying, God, whatever you need me to do today, whatever you need to be me to be in my family, in my workplace, whatever, I'm willing to do that for God. And the real gospel is that we have opportunities again and again every day to confess that, yeah, we do fail, but to be reassured that God forgives us. So, in answer to the initial question, how is worship reflected into our daily lives? Well, it's reflected when we spend time in God's Word, when we spend time in Christian community, when we praise God for what He has done for us, and when we spend our lives with Christ as the focal point. This has been Real Life, Real Gospel, Episode 7 on Worship. If, you, if this is your first episode, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was helpful for you. That is the goal. And if you're curious about what else we've done, we have six other episodes. And again, they are on whatever platform you could 
possibly want to listen to a podcast on, they're on Spotify, Google Podcast, iTunes. We're on Podbean. We're on YouTube. Um, and we release every Thursday. If you are on any of those platforms, go ahead and subscribe. And that way, if we do bonus content and as we release, you are the first person to know. And with that, this has been Real Life, Real Gospel. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.